All right, well, if you have your Bible with you this evening, uh, please turn to John 17. John 17, we're going to be looking at verses 20 through uh, 23 tonight as we finish studying the first request that Jesus makes for us and for his church uh, during his high priestly prayer. Uh, Just so you recall, in John 17 records for us a prayer that Jesus offered up just a few short hours before he was going to be betrayed and then handed over to be arrested to go to the cross. And whereas many of us, as I was thinking about it, would become extremely self-focused, and we do before a time of testing, at least I remember during my college exams, that would usually what would be be happening, Uh, Jesus, even in the final hours before his death, he was still focused on one primary thing, the same thing he had been focused on his whole earthly life, and that is to magnify his Father's glory here on earth. And this prayer contains three ways that Jesus planned on doing that, and that is through his cross, through his companions, and through his church. And we are now in that final section of Jesus' plan of glorifying his Father here on earth through the church, and specifically we're looking at verses 21 through 24 of John 17, which contains Jesus' requests for us. And there are two major ones. First, Jesus prays for our present unity in him, that's in verses 21 through 23. And then second, Jesus prays for our future glory with him, and that's in verse 24. The last time we were together, we started looking at that first request of Jesus's, that is for our present unity in him. Jesus prays at the beginning of verse 21, he says that they may all be one. And we talked about that, that that is not an undefined oneness that Jesus is praying for here. Uh, In fact, it is defined quite clearly by Jesus in this passage. He describes the true and genuine unity that all true believers possess, independent of any human activity or association. He's describing a true, genuine, present Christian unity that is grounded in doctrinal truth, genuine salvation, missional purpose, personal holiness, and proper affections. Last week we saw that this oneness that Jesus prays for is a oneness in doctrinal truth. That was seen actually in verse 20 as Jesus defined who he was praying for in verse 21. And that is for those who would believe in him through the apostles' words, that is, the scriptures. And we studied at great length that Christian unity can only be found among those who are truly Christian. That is, among those who have been given hearts of faith, of submission, and of humble dependence towards Christ and towards his word. And so the oneness that Jesus prayed for is a oneness that is found in doctrinal truth. Second, it's a oneness that Jesus prayed for in genuine salvation. That was seen in verse 21. As Jesus says that the oneness that he was praying for is similar to the oneness that he shared with the Father. He says, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. And the oneness being talked about there is a oneness in nature and in essence, that all believers would be in the triune God, in his son Jesus Christ, equally, that they would all be the same. In other words, genuinely saved. Uh, So that's the second way that Jesus prayed for oneness. He prayed for oneness in doctrinal truth and oneness in genuine salvation. Christian unity can only be found among those who are genuinely Christian. Tonight, we're going to look at the remaining three ways that Jesus prayed for our oneness, and that is oneness in missional purpose, personal holiness, and proper affections. So, True, genuine Christian unity. So the type of unity that Jesus prays for here is found in doctrinal truth, genuine salvation, missional purpose, personal holiness, and proper affection. So with that in mind, uh, let's read our passage tonight from John 17, 20 through 26. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes these words of Christ uh, for us today. He says, I do not ask for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, 
to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this passage of Scripture, and I thank you for how it reveals to us the beating heart of Christ. Father, we thank you to have this truth. We rejoice in it, and we rejoice that when we see the heart of Christ beating, it beats for your glory, and though we don't deserve it, by your grace we see that it beats for our eternal good as well. We thank you that right now he is at your right hand interceding for us, carrying out a very similar ministry as what's described in this chapter. And so, Father, I just pray that you would show us once again afresh the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we might become better followers and worshipers and servants of him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, we have to understand that when Jesus prays for our present unity, In him, he's praying for a unity that can be found, as I said, in doctrinal truth, genuine salvation, and then third, unity in missional purpose. That's what I see there in verse 21, where Jesus says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me me so that's the mission right that is the objective behind this christian unity that jesus is praying for here it's all so that the world would know and would believe that god sent jesus into this world in other words that they would believe that jesus is from god that jesus is divine that he is as luke nine thirty five says god's son god's chosen one and you ought to listen to him That is the unity that Jesus is praying for. It is a unity in missional purpose. You know what that shows, as I was thinking about it? It shows that genuine Christian unity, when it's truly on display in this world, is always focused on one common preeminent mission. Knowing Christ in all of his divine glory and making him known. Christian unity is not primarily on display when believers link arms in order to feed the poor, reform society, pass laws, or support religious institutions. Although all of those things are good. Christian unity is primarily on display when believers link arms to lift high the name of Jesus Christ and him crucified in all of his divine, transcendent, and exalted glory. It is seen when believers share a common missional purpose to make sure that all the world knows that Jesus is the Christ, as John says later, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Where that great mission grips the heart of true believers, that's where you will find genuine Christian unity. Where another mission takes its place, that's where you'll see Christians fracture. Where, where genuine Christian unity resides is where this great missional purpose stands. As Philippians 1.27 describes us, it is when we stand side by side for the faith of the gospel that we are most united. And so that's the type of unity that Jesus is praying for here, and it's the type of unity that all believers possess. It is a unity in missional purpose. And together, Jesus reminds us that it creates a unified corporate testimony and witness to the rest of the world. Because as unbelievers see all the world over, people of all different types and stripes who are not distracted by a thousand different interests or missions or pursuits in life, but instead are united beyond any human association with one missional purpose, to know Christ and to make Him known, that is true Christian unity. And they can see that there's something true here, something genuine, something divine and supernatural and so that's the unity that jesus is praying for here it is a unity that would be reflected in doctrinal truth in genuine salvation in missional purpose and fourth in personal holiness 
That's in verse 22, and I'll admit this is a little difficult to understand, but Jesus says here, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. Jesus tells us here that one of the ways believers are made one in him is that they receive from Christ the glory that Christ shared with the Father here on earth. Now, what glory is that? I, and I'm going to give myself away here i don't think he's talking about future glory why because that's mentioned later on at the end of this prayer back in verse down in verse 24 i think he's talking about another type of glory um what glory is that i would say it is the glory of his character his virtue and his moral attributes um, if you remember when Moses asked God in Exodus thirty three eighteen to show me your glory, what did God do in that moment? Did he take Moses up into the mountain and then put on a light display to make his mouth drop open? <laughs> no, he put Moses in a cleft of a rock and he walked by and he proclaimed to Moses there the name and the character of the Lord, right? That he was the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, patient, faithful, forgiving, and holy. That was the glory of the Lord. It was the name of the Lord. It was His character. And I think this is the first sense in which God has given us the glory that He shares with the Father. It is through our union with Him. He has united us to His holy character. We are children of holiness, as 1 Peter chapter 1 says. In essence, Jesus is praying for us exactly what he prayed for his disciples back in verse 11 of this prayer when he said, Holy Father, keep them in your name. What name? The holy name, right? Which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. That's what Jesus is referring to here. That is the glory that the Father has given him, that he has given to us. It is the glory of his holiness. Jesus is saying, my very own glory, your very own glory, your virtue, your character, your holiness, Father, which you have given to me while on earth, I am giving to them. And that's exactly what we see elsewhere in Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21, if you remember, tells us that we have been made the very righteousness of God in Him. We stand before God in the very holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. We have a righteousness, not our own, that comes through faith in Christ, as Philippians 3, 9 says, the very righteousness of God that depends on faith. By Christ's one act of obedience, Romans 5, 19 reminds us, we have been made righteous. We have been sanctified, Hebrews 10, 10 says. We have been made holy through the offering of Jesus Christ once and for all. That is exactly what Jesus is promising through his prayer here. Personal holiness before God in heaven. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. And what is the result of this personal holiness? It is unity. Jesus says that they may be one even as we are one. See, there is no sin that separates the Father from the Son. Or the Son from the Father. There is no shadow of turning or of lessening of holiness to distinguish one from the other. They are both fully and equally one in holiness. And so it is with believers. There is no distinction, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified, are declared righteous by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, in Christ Jesus, we're all the same. All in equal standing before God the Father. Sinners made perfectly righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is the unity that Jesus prays for and that all believers possess. It is a unity in personal holiness. And I just have to say, a personal holiness that is more than just positional in a believer's life, but is also practical as well. As Ephesians 4.24 says, those of us who are in Christ Jesus are being created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In Christ, we're not only declared holy, we are being made holy increasingly every day. We're being transformed, as 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, from one degree of glory into another. And that's because it's no longer, as Paul says, I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. There's no way that you or I could ever possibly live anything close to like a pure or righteous life here on earth if God himself in his glory did not first come to live in us. And that's exactly what Jesus promises through his prayer here. Personal holiness that's not only positional but also increasingly practical as well. And where that is found, where believers 
are marked by a positional and practical personal holiness, there you will see Christian unity. True Christian unity. Just as 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another. Fellowship with one another. And so this is the type of unity that Jesus prays for. It is a unity in doctrinal truth, in genuine salvation, in missional purpose, in personal holiness. And then finally, it is a unity in proper affections. And that's in verse 23, where Jesus says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Jesus starts off by describing the tight oneness that he wants all believers to possess by saying, I in them and they in me. It's a threefold union described there that involves the Father, the Son, and all believers. It's describing a tight-knit unity and fellowship that we have been entered into and have been folded into uh, into the triune God. In Christ, God has brought us, let me put it this way, in Christ, God has brought us into the tightest relationship and fellowship that has ever existed, the Trinity. And He has brought us into that tight relationship and fellowship why he says so that they may become perfectly one here at last we come to a growing unity that jesus prays for on behalf of his church every other type of unity he's been describing so far is a is a is a unity that currently exists here is one that he says okay it exists but i want it to grow I want it to become more perfectly one. A growing unity. A oneness that we would become more one in. That we would grow in experiencing and enjoying more here on earth. And what reality is that oneness centered around that we particularly need to grow in? And that we will because we have been folded into the triune life. Well, that reality that this oneness is centered around that we need to grow in is love. It is a oneness in divine devoted godly grace-filled love that's the oneness that we need to grow in jesus says so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me so here we see the evangelistic impact of growing in experiential love and unity with other believers it communicates the message according to what jesus says here that god exists And that in love, he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save a people for his glory. Listen, the only way, this was convicting when I thought about it, the only way that the unsaved world can see the love that the father has for his son, and the only way that the world can see that the love, see the love that the father has for his people, is through us. It's through us. As we reflect His loving heart, the world comes to know God's love as they come to see our love for Christ and for each other. As John 13, 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. God's love is shown to this world through our love for Christ and for His people and it validates the message that we're, that we're sharing. That God so what? Loved the world. That He gave His only Son so that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. How will the world know that message? They will know it by our love that we show towards Christ and towards each other. They'll see it. And those two loves, by the way, really are connected. We live in a world where they're wanting to separate it. I love Jesus. I just don't want anything to do with the church. That is not what you see here from the heart of Christ. When you love Christ, you'll love Christ's body and bride, the church. You'll have the very love of God who loves both His Son and His people. They will know, as the song says, that we are Christians by our love. And so I want the world to know how much God loves Christ. And I want the world to know how much God loves His people. And so I need to demonstrate that for them to see. I need to show the world my love for Jesus. And I need to show the world 
my love for other believers so that they can see the love that I want to share. This is the unity that Jesus prays for. It's a unity in doctrinal truth, genuine salvation, missional purpose, personal holiness, and proper affections. It is not a unity at the, at the lowest common denominator where you abandon all things for some superficial appearance of unity. It is not that at all. It is something deep. It is something genuine. It is something spiritual. It is something supernatural. And it is something that God gifts to His people for the glory of the Father here on earth. That the world would know and that the Son may glorify the Father. This is the unity Jesus prays for. And so, in His mission to glorify His Father here on earth, this is Jesus' first request. It is that we would exhibit a present unity in Him. And I hope you've seen over the last couple of weeks how important true Christian unity is to the heart of Christ for His people. It's a unity that is independent of any human associations. Don't fall for that argument. It is a unity that is grounded in doctrinal truth, genuine salvation, missional purpose, personal holiness, and proper affections. This unity is something that we cannot create on our own. It is a supernatural gift given by the Father to His people through the Son. And we are called to live it out in our lives as a testimony to the watching world. And so, my call to you as we come to the end of of this section of study is let's pray for it then. Let's pray for it if it only comes from Him. Let's pray that God would reflect His own oneness as we become more united in our truth, in our humility, in our mission, in our holiness, and in our affections as a faith family at Grace Chapel so that the world would be able to see and know that the Father has sent His Son into this world for the glory of His name and for the good of all those who will trust in Him. May God give us grace to share this.